Amen. Be still my soul. Just reading that this morning in Psalm 46, I think it's verse 10. Be still my soul. It's actually in the context, it's a call to the nations of the earth to shut up and look to God. Listen to him. That's really what it is. It's, it's not uh, the way we often use it, but I mean, it can be applied that way, obviously. But we need to be still because we know who he is, right? I want to thank those of you that uh, remembered to pray for us this past week. My wife and I, of course, traveled to Virginia to take part in uh, my daughter-in-law, Kiernan's mother's homegoing. She went to be with the Lord, 69 years old. She got saved at 27, and she was a godly woman. She really was. And she made such a difference in her family's lives, and I'm thankful for her memory and the impact that she has had, not only on her family, but many other people. But having just preached a funeral a few days ago, the events that are recorded in Genesis chapter 50, where we are this morning, are really a reminder of a sobering fact that I shared at that funeral, and that is this. If you haven't figured it out by now, our bodies are dying. The outward man perisheth. And I think that's probably why we put so much emphasis on the outward man, is because even subconsciously we realize the body is dying. It's wearing out. In fact, here's a sobering thing. The death rate is 100%. And the only, the only way that that won't happen is if Jesus comes before the death takes you over. But I want you to also know this, that death is not an accident. Did you know that the Bible says that it is appointed unto men or people once to die? It's not an accident. It is an appointment. And obviously, because it is an appointment, everyone needs to be ready to meet that appointment. You need to be ready for that appointment. None of us know when that appointment is going to take place. So we have to always be ready when death knocks. Well, chapter 50, the way I want to look at it with you, it's three burials. There are three burials in chapter 50. Two of them are literal, one of them is figurative. And you'll see what I mean as uh, we quickly as possible go through this chapter. Three of them, and all of them are, are important. And I want to call your attention to the two literal ones first, and then do what I don't normally do. I want to go back to the middle of the chapter and look at the one figurative burial that is there. Before we go any further, let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you. We always need you. And we're most aware of our need of you at times like this or when troubles come. And we want to thank you for it all. We know that you mean everything in our lives for good. We thank you for this passage this morning, and I pray that you would use this time that we have together to really get glory to your name, undertake for your messenger, and also for the listeners, that we might uh, be tuned to what you have to say, what you want us to receive. We just thank you, Lord, that we can depend upon you completely, knowing that the Word of God is more powerful than any two-edged sword because it goes deep into the inner person and it is able to cut and divide between soul and spirit. It's that precise and that deep, that powerful. Use it as such. You're the skillful surgeon Spirit of God, use that sword as a surgeon would a scalpel and accomplish your purpose for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
Let's look first of all at the burying of a father, and of course the father being Jacob, and that's the first 14 verses. You know, it's always difficult to bury a loved one. It's meant to be that way. In fact, I think grief ought to be a part of death. You are not more spiritual if you don't grieve. In fact, look at what uh, Joseph does here in Genesis 50, verse 1. Joseph, well, let's back up to the last verse of chapter 49. When Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, and he yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. That gathering unto the people is a euphemism for death. And it also implies the fact that life doesn't end at physical death. But there is an immortality of the soul, and we know that the Bible also teaches there is a bodily resurrection as well that we look forward to. But that, uh, that's the, the backdrop for what happens in verse 1 of chapter 50. When, Joseph, when, when Joseph's father died, it says, Joseph fell upon his father's face, and he wept and kissed him. I don't know about kissing a corpse, but people do it. People do it. And here's uh, a son kissing the corpse of his father because of grief. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel, or Jacob. Forty days were fulfilled for him. So uh, fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And then the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days, seventy days. And when the days of his mourning were past, jo Joseph spake unto his, the house of Pharaoh, saying, If I found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father. By the way, I'm in verse 7, if you're following along. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Wow, that is quite a contingent. And all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, or in the region of the Jordan. Therefore God dealt well with the mid... Uh, I'm sorry. I skipped a, a page here. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentations. And uh, he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which means the mourning or the grief of the Egyptians, which is uh, beyond Jordan or in the region of the Jordan River. So, I read those verses as quickly as I could because I wanted you to get the picture. What's happening here could all be summed up under the heading of grief. It's proper and it is normal to grieve and even to cry at the death of a loved one. Joseph, he's a godly man. And at his father's death, uh, which of course wasn't unexpected, they knew it was coming, he still, if you note uh, in that uh, first verse, he fell on his father's face, he wept, he kissed his his. Uh, his dead father, and then he joined the Egyptians in observing 70 days of mourning, plus seven days after the funeral procession, a procession reached the land of Canaan. It's a long time. You know, I have read that grieving at the loss of a loved one is uh, done in stages. There is a stage from when the dying takes place to the funeral. 
that's called a crisis stage. And often a funeral is uh, part of the closure that is so much a part of saying goodbye to a loved one. But then following the funeral, there is a stage that has been termed the crucible stage in which the person that is left behind is dealing with the loss. And that goes on for weeks and months after the death of that loved one. And then when you get past that, there is what they call the, the construction stage in which the individuals that have lost their loved one move on and they begin to rebuild uh, their life and uh, they pick up and uh, do what uh, they have to do. You see all of that really. You see these steps in these first 11 verses. In fact, uh, uh, as you read on, you see in verse 12, his sons did according as he commanded them his sons carried him into the land of Canaan, that's Jacob, his dead body. They buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham bought with the field for possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. There they are, they're returning. Uh, they're, they're getting back to work. Uh, they're going on with their lives, basically. And what you see here is not only grief, but you see grace. And that is the answer to grief, is grace. And it's grace from the Lord. Someone said that when a Christian dies, it's not goodbye, it's good night. And isn't it interesting and isn't it important to recognize that the Bible calls death sleep? It's not goodbye. It's merely good night because we're going to meet again on that great resurrection morn, whenever that is. In fact, the writer tells us in the book of 1 Thessalonians that it's all right to grieve. But we don't, we grieve differently than the world does because the world doesn't have any hope, we do. We grieve not as others which have no hope, because we have all kinds of hope into the future for all eternity. We have hope that there is going to be a great resurrection, and when that happens, we will be reunited forever with our loved ones. And so there's wonderful hope and that same writer says in another uh, scripture that to be absent from the body in death is to be present with the Lord in life. And that uh, he also says in another passage that to be present with the Lord is far better than to be apart from the Lord here on this earth. Those are all wonderful thoughts that give us hope. That's grace. That's how we deal with grief. That's how we deal with death of a loved one, is grace. The grace of God is always available, and there's always a sufficient supply of it for whatever your grief level might be. And the fact of the matter is, it's not automatic. Grace is not something that you get automatically. It's something that you have to take advantage of. It's available. It's part of the provision that we have as believers. But if you don't avail yourself of it, it does you no good. It's just like having an unlimited uh, a bank account uh, that you can access, but you never access it. There is grace that is always sufficient in your grief. How do you access it? I would say, number one, by Bible exposure. By exposing your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your life to the Word of God. By biblical exposure. And then along with that, by biblical explanation. What good is it to expose yourself to the Bible if you don't understand what the Bible is saying? And so you have to have understand. There has to be exposure to the Word of God that brings explanation of that Word to your heart. 
And that also, I think, must be followed then by what we would call biblical execution. By that I mean you carry out what you understand. There is grace provided. The Bible tells us that. We get that when we open God's word, expose ourselves to it. There's grace, which is strength to get us through. It's available. We understand that. But how do you get that then? How do you access that? By asking and taking. It's a step of faith. How do you get saved? By realizing your need and then asking for God's salvation and taking it. Well, that's the same way you get grace to live. This, the way you get grace to be saved is the same way you get grace to live every day. That's how you access the grace that will meet you in your grief, whatever your grief might be. Here, it's the burying of a father, Jacob. But there is also a second burial at the end of this chapter. And I told you I'm going to skip the middle and come back to that. I want you to drop down to verse 22 and go down to verse 26 with me because this is not the burial of a father. This is the burial of a brother. It's Joseph. Verse 22 says, And Joseph, he dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. When we first met him in chapter 37, he was only 17 years old. When he became the prime minister, if I can use that uh, terminology or vizar of Egypt, he was about 39 years old. Here he is really at his death. He's 110 years old. It says in verse 26, so Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. The bearing of a brother. Here it is, Joseph. And these verses really, and, I, and I'm thinking especially of verse 23 through 25, are Joseph's epitaph. Do you in, ever indulge in reading what is written on gravestones? Sometimes it's very interesting, and it gives you insight into the kind of person that, to whose body was buried there. This is Joseph's epitaph, and it gives us insight into what kind of a man he was as he comes to death. And look at verse 23. And Joseph saw the, Egyptian, the uh, Ephraim's, that's his son's children, of the third generation. Okay, get this. Joseph lived long enough not only to have children, but also to see his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. Okay? That's what we read there in that 23rd verse. The children also of Mechera, the son of Manasseh, that's his uh, grandson, Mechera, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And that might be more than just him, you know, uh, bouncing his, uh, his uh, little grandchildren uh, upon his knees, but it may actually refer to the fact that as he adopted as his own two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, he also adopted their sons as well, because it's through them that the birthright blessing will flow, remember? as we talked about that last week. But what I want you to really see in verse 23 is the epitaph of Joseph. What was this guy like? He was a powerful man. Egypt was the most powerful country on planet Earth in that day, in that ancient world. And the second most powerful man in Egypt was Joseph. He was only second to the king himself, King Pharaoh of the Egyptian Empire. But I want you to see here, it is interesting to me when you read the epitaph of Joseph, when you hear what he has to say, verse 24, he said unto his brethren, I die, 
and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he sware to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and, shall, and, and you shall carry up my bones hence. Let me tell you a little bit about this man, which is very encouraging, even on his deathbed. Joseph... Joseph's epitaph, number one, just rings out total contentment. He lived 110 years. A lot can happen, and a lot did happen, good and bad, during those 110 years. But here is really the epitome of contentment in this old man. You know how he, the way he looked at success is what really equals his contentment. His, his success was calculated in the contentment that he had with his family. Joseph was a man of fame. He was a man of fortune. He had a reputation for not only saving the land of Egypt during those seven years of starvation, famine, but really for saving the world. It was all by his wise plan that Egypt and the world didn't starve to death. Isn't it significant that none of that is mentioned by him? None of that is brought up. That's unmentioned. The only thing that is mentioned in his dying words he is his family, and uh, he's singled out. Families are really important, and you see that throughout the whole book of Genesis. And in fact, the book of Genesis singles out families because you remember through one family, the family of Abraham, all the families. All the people on planet Earth would be spiritually blessed. So it's very important to find contentment in the family. Joseph does that. He sees that. One of God's greatest blessings in our lives is the families that he puts us in, regardless of what those families might look like. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 127 that children are the inheritance of God. Children are God's gift to us. That's the way God rewards his people, by giving them children. And that's why children ought to be looked at as a blessing from God and not something that is a, a, a hardship or a difficulty or something to be avoided if uh, possible. God says it's his blessing. And your family, like the family of Abraham, your family, perhaps in a lesser sense, but still just as important, your family can be and should be a channel through which God's blessing goes to other people, other families. That's what family life is about. You are in that family to be a blessing in your home, in your family, and then for that to extend to others and other families. This is where this man found contentment in family life. That's part of his epitaph. But I also want you to note in his epitaph, not only contentment, but achievement. You know, if you ever read obituaries in the newspaper, you'll find out interesting information about the individual's life that is being memorialized in that obituary. Sometimes what is not written is just as significant as what is written. And I don't want to preach a message or even a point on the silence of the, uh, of the Bible on this life of Joseph, but I think it's significant that we understand the omission in this epitaph or this obituary, if you will. 
He is defining success in the terms of his family's spiritual prosperity, not in his career, and he could have bragged on that, not in his accomplishments, not in his finances, and I'm sure he was a wealthy man. His achievement is all about his family's spiritual prosperity. And here's a balanced man because he was a man that had a very high position and uh, a lot of responsibility in the government of Egypt. And yet, what a balance. He doesn't isolate himself. He's visible. He's active in pagan government. And yet, at the same time, he doesn't give his sons pagan Egyptian names or groom them for worldly success in the Egyptian government. His dying wish, if you look at it, his dying wish is that he and his family would be identified with an unsophisticated, unimpressive group of people called the Israelites that would one day inhabit the land of Canaan that God promised to their ancestor Abraham. You know what this tells me about Joseph? Something that ought to define us as well. He was unimpressed by worldly success. Career wasn't the end all with him. He doesn't even mention his stellar career. It's not even brought up by him on his dying bed. He's the prime minister of this most powerful nation on earth. He married up. He married in that society an Egyptian priest's daughter, but didn't give his son pagan names. And his dying wish is to be buried in a far off land. You know, he had fame. And if God gives you fame, fame is to be used as a stage to give a testimony for the Lord. That's what it's about. And that's what this man did. That's what I see in his obituary, in his epitaph. And then one more thing. I've already read verses 24 to 25. There's a third thing about his epitaph. Not only does it uh, speak of contentment and achievement, the right kind of achievement, but it speaks of endowment. When we talk about endowment, uh, endowment is normally a gift of money or property that is given by a parent to his or her children. But more important than that endowment is that we would leave a great spiritual legacy to our children and our grandchildren, that we would leave a godly legacy to them. Now be honest. I don't have a whole lot of this world's goods to leave to my wife, let alone my children. I have seven of them. And if you divide it all that up, there really would be not much. But folks, I want my children to know that they had a father that though he wasn't wealthy or successful, according to the terms that uh, this world defines it, they had a father that walked with God and that taught them the word of God and taught them the will of God and how to walk with God so that they could be spiritually successful in their lives and in their families' lives so that my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, you know, until Jesus comes, right? That's the kind of endowment that Joseph was leaving to his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren. It was a godly one. And it's seen in two parts here. First of all, there's faith. I want you to see this because he repeats it two times. And so it's important when it's emphasized twice. Look at verse 24. Look at this phrase. God will surely visit you. He said that again in verse 25. God 
will surely visit you. And he follows that up with the fact that uh, he'll bring you out of this land. He'll carry you into uh, the land of Canaan that was promised to the Israelite people. Folks, that screams faith. There is a man that really believed God and was trusting the Lord. The legacy that he leaves to his children is one of absolute faith. God will surely visit you. God will care for you. God will bring you out of this land. Wait a minute. God's made you one of the most powerful man, men in this land, and you're not wanting to stay here and enjoy? You don't want your children and your grandchildren and your and generations after them to enjoy the power that you've experienced god will surely visit you he says as a statement of faith a proof of his faith and very unusual instruction that he gives to his children his grandchildren he says on his dying bed i want you to promise me something I want you to promise me that when I die, yeah, the Egyptians are going are gonna to mummify my body. Oh, by the way, when this father, be it Jacob or Joseph speaking to his sons, when this father gets embalmed, the Egyptians were experts. We have... Uh, these sarcophagus with uh, mummies in them, right? That have been discovered in some of the pyramids. He didn't want to be. He didn't want to be buried in a pyramid. He wanted to be buried in the land of his fathers. And here he he's a daddy that becomes a mummy, <laughs> right? I couldn't resist that. Let's get back to the point. The point is this: when he says, "Take my bones." What he's saying is, I believe God is going to visit. I'm not just saying this. I'm not just throwing out a pipe dream. God will surely, see that? The emphasis there. God, I'm certain about this. God will surely visit us. God will surely do what he said he would do. There's a man of faith there. That's the kind of legacy you want to you pass on to your children and the generations that follow. That's what we want our young people here to get a hold of. If there's anything that I want in a spiritual sense is for God to visit us. I want God to visit my family. I want God to visit your family. I want God to visit our church family. Do you believe that surely God will visit us if we ask him? Has he given us promise that he would do that? I suggest yes. He certainly has. Oh God, will you please visit us? That ought to be your daily prayer. Believing prayer. He's leaving a le legacy of faith, but also of hope. You know, faith and hope are closely related. They're not only sisters. We have faith and hope that are literally sisters here in our congregation. But faith and hope are spiritual and, and Bible terms that are closely related. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says that faith is simply being sure of what you hope for. And hope in the Bible is not something that may or may not happen. Hope in the Bible is something that is certain it's going to happen. What hope is, it is patiently, expectantly waiting for the promise of God to be fulfilled. That's what hope is. So faith and hope are very closely related, but there, there's a little difference. Genesis, the book of Genesis, ends on a note of hope. God's going to visit Israel. And you know what? When you turn the page, you get into the book of Exodus, and very soon as far as reading the Bible, God does visit Israel, but it's actually 400 years. Or however you, you, uh, you judge the time that they were in Egypt. It could be anywhere from two to 400 years that goes by until God visits his people. But God does visit them. It's called the Exodus, right? That's how God visits Israel. 
He takes them out of Egypt through that uh, tenth plague and as a result leads them miraculously through the parting of the Red Sea so that the waters are like great walls on both sides and millions of people cross in a night. That's how wide those waters were parted. Hope. Let me ask you this. What kind of a legacy are we leaving for those that come behind us? Let me put it more poignantly than that. If you knew, if you knew right now that you had only one year to live, what endowment would you leave to your family? What endowment would you leave them? What legacy would you leave behind to those that follow? Are you ready for the third burial? The burying of a father, that's Jacob. The burying of a brother, that's Joseph. Now here's the third one. Jump back to verse 15 with me. And this is the burying of the past, which is really sin. Bearing sin. Bearing the past. What's happening here is really fear-driven behavior. Look at verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us uh, all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. That's fear-driven behavior there, if I've ever seen it. You know what it does? It reflects the ignorance of these brothers of what forgiveness really was. And it also reflects their lack of faith, their lack of trust. They didn't understand how God's forgiveness works. Could they trust Joseph? to forgive them, really forgive them, without the mediator dad being on the scene any longer? Yes, and here's two reasons why. And this is really how God-given forgiveness works. You need to get this today, because I am convinced that there are a lot of believers that don't know how God-given forgiveness works, and you need to know. And the first is this, Joseph's response in that 17th verse is significant. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Look at his response in verse 19, verbally. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? You know how God-given forgiveness works? It works only if you as a believer understand God's place in your life. Joseph understood God's place in his life. And he says, am I in the place of God? What did he mean by that? He's the second most powerful man in that country and in that world and yet what does he do he places himself under God and he submits to God in three specific areas number one he puts himself under God as God being a just God have you perceived God as a just God Paul quotes from the Old Testament and he says what the scripture has said all along God says vengeance is mine I will repay saith the Lord God is a God let God be judge don't you try to handle it by holding a grudge 
Let God be judge. Don't hold a grudge. That's a, a ditty you ought to remember. Don't hold a grudge. Let God be judge. Right? You believe that God's just? Do you believe that you can trust God to work out justice in the end? Or do you think you have to get involved and you have to take matters into your own hands and straighten it out? You know how God-given forgiveness works? It works when you submit to God, when you place yourself not in God's position, but under God. Am I in the place of God? No. I'm putting myself under God because I know Him to be a God of justice. God's just. Not only that, He saw God as sovereign. That is, in total control of everything. God works everything after the counsel of His will. That's what the book of Ephesians says. He's sovereign. And you need to submit yourself to the sovereign control of God over you and your situation. That's how God-given forgiveness works. It's by putting yourself under a just God and a sovereign God, and the third thing, a good God. Look at verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. You get that? You always only see God as good, regardless of the situation. You better be on your toes because I will guarantee you one of Satan's greatest deceptions is to put doubt in your mind of God's goodness when, when things get hot. Yes. When things go wrong. When everything falls apart. And it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, a false uh, saying that when it rains it pours. That's the way it seems. It's like one big thing happens and you think, wow, nothing worse than that. And then something else gets put on that. And then something else. And we think, oh, where's God? God, say this, is always only good. Say that. God is always only good. When you put yourself under God, am I in the place of God? Joseph says no. He put himself under God. He submitted himself to God, God being a just God, God being a sovereign God, God being a good God. That's how God-given forgiveness works. You can bury the past, though sinful it is, by allowing God's place in your life. But along with God's place in your life, you need God's grace in your life. God's place in your life, you put yourself under Him. God's grace in your life. I see it here. God's grace is so evident. Look at verse 21. Now therefore fear you not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And He comforted them and He spake kindly unto them. There is God's grace at work in Joseph's life. He, God's place in his life and now God's grace in his life begins to flow and it's reflected in three attitudes. Number one, humility. When they said what they said to him, dad said when we, when, when, before he died, he said, you got to forgive your brother. Joseph wept. That's what the last sentence in verse 17 says. Joseph cried. Humility. He wept, and then in verse 19, he submitted himself to be put under, the, under God and not in the place of God. That's humility. To weep and to submit to God is really the essence of humility in Joseph's life here. That's God's grace in his life. But not only that, there is honesty. In that 20th verse, he begins by saying, 
you thought evil against me. Now I want you to get a hold of that. That's honest. He is not denying the evil that they committed against him. He's pointing it out. He's identifying the sin. Not so he can smear their face in it. But he's being honest. You did evil. You meant evil in what you did to me. But it's okay because I forgive you. The only reason he identified it is so that he could then offer them forgiveness. But he doesn't cover it. He doesn't deny it. He identifies it as sin. There's honesty there. We don't deny what happened that was sinful, that was wrong. And then I love really what's going on there in verse 21. Because this is very important. There is forgiveness that is performed actively. He spake kindly to them. He comforted them. And also in that 20th verse, he said uh, that, uh, or rather the 21st verse, I will nourish you and your little ones. Don't ever forget this. This is how God-given forgiveness works. It's God's grace in your life that enables you that when your enemy hungers, you feed him. When he thirsts, you give him drink. And instead of being overcome with evil, you overcome evil with good. You actively do them good. That is, you, you thoughtfully and practically give to your enemy to meet their genuine personal need that they have in, your, in their life. If you don't know what it is, ask the Lord to show you. He will. That's a very important part of God-given forgiveness that often is missed. But that's the formula, if, you, if I could call it that. Bearing the past, the sin that has been done to you, God's place in your life and God's grace in your life. I'm telling you, bitterness, bitterness will hold you in bondage and it will hinder God's blessing in your life. But forgiveness, it frees you up to experience God's abundant grace and also to make you a channel then to extend God's grace to others who have wronged you. And when you don't do that, you grieve the Holy Spirit of God that indwells you. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put and malice be put away from you. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Dr. Henry Brandt tells of a man that lived in Uganda when he visited there. And he said as they drove to his home, they passed a huge, beautiful home. And the man told Dr. Brandt that he used to own that house. They headed out a dirt road and they pulled up to a mud shack. And the only furniture in that mud shack was a packing crate, which the two men sat on. And then the man related to Dr. Brandt how he used to be a wealthy businessman. And he said one day, Idi, uh, Idi Amin soldiers came and took his Mercedes. And he burned with anger as he saw them driving that car through the streets. And then they took his business. And he was even angrier. And finally, they took over his home and made it their headquarters and he had to move to this mud hut. And he said, one day, a missionary stopped by the mud hut and told me about God's love in Christ. And I threw him out. But he kept coming back. And he said, I finally accepted Christ as a result, and I'm able to forgive those soldiers who had taken away all the material possessions this man had. And he told Dr. Brandt, listen, quote, because through Christ I have forgiven those soldiers, I am the richest man in all of Uganda. He lived in a mud hut. 
The only furniture he had was a packing crate. Bitterness and unforgiving attitude will keep you in bondage. Forgiveness will free you. I wonder, are you impoverishing yourself by an unwillingness to forgive? By a bitter spirit that you have towards someone, which ultimately is toward God because God's big enough to prevent it and if he didn't then you can blame him too right you can be bitter at him that's how it works but I should say this we all need God's forgiveness we all need the forgiveness of God and you know what he says if you don't forgive men their trespasses against you neither will the father forgive your sins that you have sinned against him you ever sin then you need forgiveness and if you need forgiveness you got to be willing to forgive others and the only thing that can make you willing to forgive others is the grace of God the place of God in your life and the grace of God in your life and I would venture to say this I'm putting myself out on a limb there are people that are on medication for depression uh, in this city that are there because they are bitter and have never forgiven the people that did evil against them just like Joseph forgave those brothers that did evil against him try it I challenge you forgive maybe it will be the means for you to get rid of medication that you've been having to take for years I not saying for you to do to stop it without a doctor's orders but I am challenging you to think about any bitterness or unforgiveness that needs to be handled in your life let's pray Heavenly Father we look to you we need you we don't want to end up with uh, lives that are ruined we want to leave a legacy of blessing to the generation that follows us Lord, I pray that you would just use the example here of Joseph to accomplish what you want in our hearts today. If you're here and you need God's forgiveness, why don't you take it right now because he offers it. It can't be purchased. It can't be earned by your works. It is a free gift because it has been purchased by Jesus himself at the utmost cost of his own lifeblood that he poured out for you. Why don't you say, Lord, I'm a guilty sinner, but I accept the forgiveness, and I want Jesus' forgiveness for my sin. I want to be your child. I want Jesus to be my Savior. And if you're a believer and you know what it means to be forgiven, how in the world could you not forgive anyone else? You meant evil, but God meant it for good. Don't ever forget that.